Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. We're live in New York City at the StrataConf plus Hadoop World. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and I'm here with Jeff Kelly, who's uh, the big data analyst at, at Wikibon. He's been called the num number one big data analyst in the, in the industry, and uh, we're going to focus uh, the discussion here on some of the practical applications, how customers are actually applying technology to get a business capability and create business value. We're here with uh, Venki Rangashari, who is the global head of development at Thomson Reuters. Um, welcome, Venki. And your card, it says you uh, had a QED velocity analytics. Everybody's talking about speed, real time, velocity. So before we get into that, tell us a little bit about uh, what Thomson Reuters. I mean, everybody sort of knows the company, but, but, but set it up and then your role there. I work for the financial and risk business unit at Thomson Reuters. Uh, we get data from 400 stock exchanges, currency markets, commodity markets. We aggregate, consolidate those data and provide uh, it as a data feed to our customers, but also provide analytics on, on top of that. Right. So Thomson Reuters has been in the business uh, for, for a long, long time, for the last few hundred years. And the financial and risk business unit, uh, which I'm a part of, focuses on real-time market data for financial services companies. Okay, and um, can talk a little bit more about your role and, and your team. Yeah, I head up, uh, I'm part of the content uh, technology organization. I uh, head up the analytics business, so uh, our customer, it's a uh, software as a service offering uh, uh, for analytics on demand. Uh, so customers such as innocent banks, brokerage houses, hedge funds, uh, when they look to do their pre-trade, post-trade analysis and their investment strategies, they, they use our solution to, pro to get uh, to do financial analytics. So look at analytics as a set of statistical functions that a trader would use to determine their financial investment strategy. So uh, at the base, we have a large content database that ingest the data real time from the uh, stock market and then we put our uh, uh, analytics uh, solutions on top of it. So let's talk about Hadoop. I mean we're here at Hadoop World. This is the third year the Cube has been here. I think it's four years of Hadoop World. Uh, it's growing. You're, you're, you're based here, right? And uh, yeah, I'm based no, no, you're, you're in you're in uh, uh, West Coast. Okay, so. Yeah, Thompson Reuters is, head yeah. uh, is headquartered <laughs> here. Of course, right. <laughs> so. Uh, we had Mike Olson on before. He said the first Hadoop World was 500 people, and then 800, which is the first year we came, and then last year was 14 or 1500. And now it's, it's closer to 3,000, so it's really starting to grow. But you guys were early on into the to the Hadoop space. Um, yes. Talk about that. Ta take us back a little bit, and you know, to from sandbox to production. So you know, uh, I'll look. I'll take you through what we used uh, originally, right? I mean, when in the context of financial data, the type of data we refer to is called time series data, right? This is time delimited data, look at it as stock codes, uh, purchases, you know, uh, any, any information which is called ticker data, right? And relational databases didn't solve the problem for this kind of a problem. You know, you look at the rates of data that we get, we typically get data that peaks at about two to, two to three million messages per second. It's also called ticks per second. So at that data rate, relational databases don't scale. So, so 13 years back, we we built a proprietary database. Uh, one of the companies that Thomson Reuters acquired uh, in the West Coast, uh, and and this company built its own proprietary database, stored the database in a very uh, flat file type of format, very optimized from an ingestion and query perspective. So that's that's kind of the background, but. Y you know, having your own proprietary database, you you also ha have the share of problems of scalability. You know, improving it. You know, we're not an Oracle or a Microsoft or SQL Server to sort of staff that amount to sort of do that. And uh, you know, you know, at that time we didn't have as much of options around there. And uh, slowly over the last couple of years, we've been looking at Hadoop, we've been looking at Cassandra, and the other NoSQL and big data uh, players in there. And we did a couple of experiments and were kind of pleasantly surprised about the results that we got in the space. You know, so okay, so essentially what you're doing is w you use Hadoop for, for, for batch, you use Cassandra for real time now? We use, uh, we, we use Cassandra for real time, and we use uh, Hadoop for all our historical data. So you look at, you can 
segment data into two pieces, right? You have near real time data, which is, um, you know, zero to six months of data, right? And then you have historical data, which is six months to 12 years of data. Um, so we use Cassandra for a lot of the real time applications in there. And then we also have historical data that people run queries across multiple years. We use Hadoop for doing that. Interesting. Yeah, could, could you add a little color to that? Maybe some examples. So what are some of the real-time applications on Cassandra you're doing? And then maybe we can tie that to the more batch uh, type of analytics, deep historical analytics, uh, and how they complement one another. So the, you know, one of the prime reasons why we chose Cassandra was its ingestion capability, mm -hmm. right? You know, we, when you get data at real time, you got to take it or you lose it, <laughs> right? So you get data at two or three million messages per second. You got to, the, f the first piece of the puzzle is to ingest the data and put it in a database, right? And when we tested Cassandra against other NoSQL and even Hadoop, Cassandra had a unique capability of optimized, being very optimized for insertions. Mm -hmm. And so when we tested some of our ingestion rates, we were able to get some of the uh, loads and hundreds of thousands of inserts per second uh, mm. using even a nine to 10 node Cassandra cluster, right? So that was pretty, uh, that was almost twice our current capacity. Wow. So, so that was part of the reason why we chose Cassandra. The other part is uh, how we can efficiently provide some of the analytics on top of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the data is distributed into multiple nodes and when, an, uh, when a quantitative analyst in a, you know, Innocent Banking House provides a, uh, a function like they want to do a volume weighted average across, say, a bucket of stocks, NASDAQ 100, mm -hmm. you know, for, for the last six months, right? Mm -hmm. we, we provide that using Cassandra, right? Uh, if, if somebody says, I want it over the, the last two years, then we, we got to take some data from Cassandra and some data from Hadoop mm -hmm. and stitch it into one query, right? Um, most of the data comes in the f uh, within the last six months, right? Mm -hmm. And keep in mind the way the way we do data is, we do our d uh, data strategy is the intraday data is in the memory. So, uh, okay. y you know, if you take, in terms of size of data, uh, an intraday data for from a New York Stock Exchange perspective is, is about 400 gigs. So we, we hold the data in the memory and mm -hmm. do batch writes into Cassandra. So the eventual consistency that Cassandra offers is ideal for a use case, right? Oh, we serve a lot of data from out of the cache, right? So can you compare, so you, you talked about before you had your own database, you actually acquired a company that provided that uh, for you. So that gave you some competitive advantage, but mm -hmm. it was hard to sustain that because mm -hmm. you <laughs> had to do all the R&D, all the support, all the training. Um, how has life changed? with this sort of Hadoop, open source, uh, e other, how have you accommodated the ecosystem to sort of replicate that competitive advantage, you know, today? Uh, you know, you know, simple thing is, uh, y you know, using Cassandra, we're almost able to do 2x more ingestion. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to, we're able to scale out the infrastructure. In our old iteration, we were, the, the only way we could scale is go vertically, right? We used to buy more CPUs, more memory, bigger machines, and bigger boxes, right? And Chasing <laughs> chips. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of solid state memories and go, uh, doing the work, right? Uh, with Cassandra, we're able to scale. So in that way, you know, horizontal scalability was a critical component. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, going with Cassandra, I think we solved that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the second piece I I is also the, the fact that we had large amount of this historical data lying in tapes and flat files and file systems, right? Uh, we are a data company and we, we always want to monetize this by you know, giving the right data and analytics to our customers. We couldn't do this before. I mean, today with Hadoop, we can put it into Hadoop and somebody says, I want 10 symbols of last four years of data. I want a volume weighted average and you know, these criteria, I could cull the data and provide that as a package to the customer. You know, so I mean, Try searching for that in two to three petabytes of data of a flat, <laughs> flat, <laughs> flat files, right? You know, you right. could, you c it would be days to do mm -hmm. that, right? So, so I think that's an uh, uh, interesting challenge that we are able to take advantage of some of the big data technology and solve mm -hmm. that piece in there. Uh, I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk uh, talk about some of the applications that you're building on top of Cassandra because you know we're we're hearing a lot at this conference about big data applications finally I'd say because we've been you know at Wikibon we've been doing a lot of research around this and just hasn't been a lot of activity and ultimately yeah. it's those applications that kind of bring the data to life and and help the end user actually take action 
action. Gain insights and take action. So uh, how how do you go about the actual application development process? You get a, you know you, it sounds like you get requirements specific requirements from your clients mm -hmm. I, I, that certainly requires you to respond quickly, uh, very agile and develop applications that sit on top of Cassandra. So take us through how you go about doing that. Yeah, I mean, what what we provide is a uh, application <coughs> platform. Uh, a mm -hmm. lot of the financial services customers are moving towards R as a analytics, uh, you know, uh, programming paradigm for, you know, for their analytics, right? And so we use R a as a platform and the uh, the quantitative analyst within within a bank basically do their sp uh, strategies and their functions in in R, mm -hmm. which then takes the data from Cassandra or Hadoop and, and serves it out. Keep in mind that a lot of the statistical formulas or strategies are intellectual property for a bank because that's that's their algorithms that they build out of. We don't get that we were a, we are able to have a proprietary space in mm -hmm. uh, a, a customer owned area. And we have a bucket of generic analytic functions that we provide on top of that. Now, how do you so use data stacks? Um, we use we use data stacks as the underlying tick database. Okay, so, so it's so it's not the native at Apache. It's I mean, it's essentially the data stacks uh, enterprise edition. Is you data stacks enterprise with a combination of Solar and Hadoop. Okay, so you use so Solar for search. Hadoop. We use Solar for search. Hadoop for the historical data. Hadoop for historical Cassandra data. Cassandra for the last six months. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And uh, you know, you know. It Data stack's ability to provide the monitoring and provisioning aspect of it is it helps in ease of operations, right? You know, you need a new new node, you need a new Cassandra node. Data stacks is a UI-driven uh, tool that can help create a new node. You know, rebalance nodes, provide monitoring across all the processes there, and so that's about. So, data stacks gives you the same that management infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, for you to be able to. If I guess focus on other things. Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Helps us sleep better. <laughs> 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 right. Good. So, uh, what do you what do you make of uh, of of the conference this year? The conference is very you know I mean ex exciting to see a lot of new players, a lot of uh, new entrants in the application space uh -huh. and the visualization space. We've been having some new interesting entries there. So. You know, great to see a good amount of excitement around the big data space. Is that your main sort of interest area is, is visualization, uh, trying to get more uh, users being able to see the data? Is that a challenge yeah, of I yours? Think, uh, yeah, I mean, that is a challenge for us. And, uh, you know, it's like early early days, right, in terms of visualization tools. Yeah. So uh, we're looking uh, for some, some neat visualization tools to build on top for for our analytic solution there. So th mm. so that is a key challenge for us. Excellent. All right, Venky, well, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE, uh, sharing your practitioner knowledge, and, uh, and, good, and, good, and good luck going forward, and uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, keep it right there. Uh, we'll be right back. We've got a number of guests today. It's a crazy lineup here. Um, so keep it right there. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE.TV's continuous coverage of Strata and Hadoop World, and we're live. We'll be right back. <laughs>